Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Omalo Frederick. I'll teach a Form 4 topic known as Reception, Response and Coordination, which is the third topic of biology of Form 4 based on 844 system. So the topic is Reception. Response and coordination. Reception, response, and coordination is very important to all living organisms, be they unicellular organisms, multicellular organisms, or plants or animals, or any given type of living organism, because Response, coordination, enables living organisms to be able to adapt to their particular environments. And without adaptation of living organisms to the environment, then it means they will become extinct. They will die and become extinct. So the importance of coordination, response, is to enable living organisms to be able to adapt to various habitats where they are found and therefore be able to survive. Then we'll start off by defining some words that will be used or terms that will be used in the whole of this topic. Some of them include response. Response means change in activity of a particular motile cell or the whole body of an living organism due to a particular stimulus. Reception. Reception means the ability of an organism to detect change in the environment. Stimulus. Coordination means working together of various organs within the body of a living organism in order to achieve particular response and coordination. I mean response to a particular, a particular stimulus. So coordination, working together of various organs within the body of a living organism in order to achieve a particular response to a particular stimulus. Then stimulus. Stimulus is change in environment that evokes response. That is maybe change in temperature, change in light intensity. All those refer to different types of stimuli that evoke response. That is, they make a living organism to respond in a particular manner. The other terms will be receptors and effectors. Receptors are specialized organs whose main function is to detect or perceive a particular stimulus. For example, we have the eyes which are capable of detecting light. We have ears for perceiving sound. Some body parts of plants, for example, the roots of plants are capable of detecting water, change in chemical concentration within the soil, and some leaves of plants also serve as receptors because they're capable of detecting changes within the environment. Then you have effectors. Effectors are body parts, organs, or tissues that are capable of bringing about the desired change. For example, we have biceps and triceps. When an individual touches a hot object, the biceps will contract triceps will relax and the arm will be drawn from a hot or sharp object. So in that case, our muscles will be effectors. Even the eyelids are effectors because when the eyes are exposed to bright light, the eyelids shut. Leaves of plants can also serve as effectors. There are some plants, for example, mimosa pudica plants, that when their leaves are touched, they end up folding their leaves. So in that case, the leaves are the ones bringing about the desired change. Fine. Then, sensitivity or irritability.
Sensitivity or irritability refers to the ability of the body of the living organism or the ability of a motile cell to detect change within the environment and respond appropriately. So irritability and sensitivity, one and the same thing. Ability of a living organism or a motile cell to be able to detect change within the environment and then respond accordingly. Response, we mentioned before that it is the action that is taken by a living organism due to a particular stimulus or due to different types of stimuli. So response being the change in activity brought about by a particular stimulus can either be positive or negative. So in short, response can be divided into two, either positive response or negative response. Response is considered to be positive when an, the whole body of an organism or a motile cell moves towards the stimulus. For example, we do have unicellular organisms like euglena. When euglena is exposed to unidirectional source of light, then you'll find euglena moving towards the unidirectional source of light. In that case, we talk about positive response, the organism moving towards the stimulus. Then we have negative response. In negative response, a motile cell or the whole body of an organism moves away from the stimulus. For example, we do have termites. When termites are exposed to unidirectional source of light, termites will move away from the source of light into dark areas. That simply means termites experience negative phototaxis, meaning they're moving away from the stimulus, which in this case is light. So they move to dark sides. So positive response, an organism moves towards the stimulus. Negative response, an organism moves away from the stimulus. Fine. There are several types of responses. Responses can be classified as specific or general. For specific response, it simply means an organism or a unicellular organism or a motile cell behaving in a particular way and that particular type of response is specific to a particular group of living organisms. For example, tropism. These are growth responses that are restricted to plants. Taxis. Responses that are restricted to plants. Then you can talk about other different types of responses which are restricted to animals. We talk about specific responses. But in terms of uh, general responses, a general response will apply to unicellular organisms, multicellular organisms, even motile cells. So it refers to any type of response exhibited by a plant, an animal, or any given independent cell that can experience movement, for example, sperm cells. Then, based on those two types of responses, general and specific, we'll start off with general response. The main general response that we'll start off with will be taxis. Taxis. Taxis is a general response because it applies to motile cells, it applies to animals, it also applies to plants. So it's a general type of response. Being a general type of response, it can either be positive or negative. As you had mentioned earlier, positive response is where an organism or motile cell moves towards the stimulus. In negative response, motile cell or an organism moves away from the stimulus. Definition of taxis. Taxis is locomotory response 
due to unidirectional stimulus. Here, locomotory means the whole body of a motile cell or the whole body of a living organism will be changing position. Unidirectional in this case means stimulus from one particular direction. So taxis is a locomotory response in which the whole body of a living organism or the whole body of a motile cell moves due to particular unidirectional stimulus. We have several different types of taxis or tactic responses. The various types of tactic responses are named according to the stimuli that evoke them. For example, if the stimulus that brings about that particular type of response is light, then the stimulus I mean, if the stimulus in this case is light, then the type of tactic response will be phototaxis. That is response brought about by light. If it's response brought about by a chemical substance, then the type of tactic response would be chemotaxis. So we have several different types of tactic responses that are named according to the stimuli that evoke them or stimuli that make them happen. These types of tactic responses can either be positive or negative. They will be positive if an organism moves towards the stimulus, negative if an organism moves away from the stimulus. Let's start off with the first one. Phototaxis. Phototaxis is locomotory response due to unidirectional source of light. That is response due to light from one particular direction. Phototaxis can either be positive or negative. Let's look at specific examples of positive and negative phototaxis. Positive phototaxis is experienced by euglena. Euglena is a unicellular organism. Looks like this. It has flagellum for locomotion and then it has chloroplast. So when euglena is exposed to unidirectional source of light, maybe light from this direction, then what would happen is euglena would move towards that particular source of light. In that case, we talk about positive phototaxis. Positive phototaxis exposes the body of euglena for maximum absorption of sunlight, which it then uses in the process of photosynthesis. I'll give an example of negative phototaxis. Negative phototaxis is experienced by maggots, termites, and wood lice. When these organisms are exposed to light from one particular direction, they'll move away from the source of light into the dark side. So with them, they move away from the stimulus Therefore, the type of response is negative. Being light, negative phototaxis. So in short, we've seen two examples of phototaxis, positive phototaxis and negative phototaxis. We look into the next type of uh, tactic response, which is chemotaxis.
Chemotaxis is locomotor response due to unidirectional source of life, I mean source of a chemical substance. So chemotaxis, locomotor response due to unidirectional source of a chemical substance. Chemotaxis can also be positive or negative. I'll start by giving an example of positive chemotaxis. In positive chemotaxis, we have moss plants and ferns. The, male, the female part of the moss plant is known as archegonia. which produces ovum. Archegonia itself secretes a chemical substance. A chemical substance which attracts the male gametes known as antheridia. So, in most plants, Archegonia, the female part, secretes a chemical substance that attracts the male gametes known as antheridia. So in this case, we will be talking about positive chemotaxis in the sense that antheridia move towards Archegonia, which has secreted a chemical substance that attracts them. That's important because it enables fertilization to take place in most plants and ferns. Another example of uh, negative chemotaxis, we do have insecticides. Insecticides are chemical substances that are meant for killing insects like mosquitoes, houseflies, and many others. So, in negative chemotaxis, if an insecticide is sprayed from one particular direction, let's say it's sprayed from east or left side, spray it to an insect. Then, let's assume the insect has wings. So when the spray is on, from the left side, sprayed on the insect which is on the right hand side, then the insect will fly away from the source of insecticide. In this case, we are talking about negative chemotaxis an organism moving or flying away from unidirectional source of a chemical substance. So, in that case we have the positive and negative examples of chemotaxis. The third type of tactic response that we look into will be aerotaxis. Aerotaxis refers to locomotor response due to change or variation in oxygen concentration. So aerotaxis, locomotor response due to variation in oxygen concentration. Let's take, for example, if this diagram is to represent a pond. Of course, pond has fresh water in this case. And then we take an example using amoeba. Amoeba is a unicellular organism that has nucleus and contractile vacuole. Since air blows over the surface of the pond water, the upper surface of water will have high concentration of oxygen compared to the lower parts of the water body. So what in uh, aerotaxis, if amoeboid cell moves from reg the region of low oxygen concentration on the bottom part of the pond to the upper part of the pond surface where concentration of oxygen is high, then you talk about positive aerotaxis. So amoeboid cells can experience positive aerotaxis when they move from regions of low oxygen concentration 
to regions of high oxygen concentration. Next that you look into will be thermotaxis. So that's the fourth type of taxis. Thermotaxis is locomotory response due to variation in temperature. Thermotaxis can be experienced by an organism like paramecium. <clears throat> paramecium is a unicellular organism that uses cilia as its structures for locomotion. Paramecium also lives inside water. Let's assume this diagram here to represent a pond. Then there is a sun shining on the upper part. When the rays of the sun reach the surface of water body, then the upper surface of water would be warm. Take for example, 25 degrees Celsius. Let's take this paramecium found on the bottom part of the water body. Where the bottom part of the water body, let's say temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. So at the bottom part of the water body, maybe a pond, temperature is very low on the bottom part and a little bit high on the upper part. So what will happen is, once paramecium has detected that the upper part of water body is warm and the lower part of the water body is cold, then paramecium will move from the bottom part of the water body where temperatures are low to the upper part of the water body where temperatures are high. So paramecium is experiencing positive thermotaxis, moving from a region of low temperature to a region of high temperature. Later on, when it will have absorbed enough heat, then <clears throat> the same, same paramecium will experience negative thermotaxis, where it will move from region of high temperature to a region of low temperature. So paramecium, as an organism that you're using to explain how thermotaxis takes place, will experience both positive and negative thermotaxis. It will experience positive thermotaxis when it moves from region of low temperature to region of high temperature towards the upper part of the water body. It will experience negative thermotaxis when it moves from region of high temperature to a region of low temperature. The next type of tactic response that we look into will be rheotaxis. Rheotaxis. Rheotaxis is locomotory response due to variation in currents. Either water currents or air currents. So rheotaxis, locomotive response due to water currents or air currents. Rheotaxis can be positive or negative. For example, when water is flowing from one particular direction, let's say we have fish here, See a fish and then water flowing from right hand side to the left hand side. When fish swims towards water current, then we call that positive rheotaxis, meaning it's moving towards the water currents. But if the fish turns and then swims away from the water currents, we call that negative rheotaxis. So fish can experience both positive and negative rheotaxis. We also have butterflies. Butterflies can also experience positive and negative rheotaxis based on air currents. When they fly towards the air currents, we call the process positive rheotaxis. When butterflies move away in a condition where they're carried away by the air currents, we talk of neg uh, negative 
rear taxis. So rear taxis, locomotive response due to water currents or air currents. It can be positive, as in the case of fish swimming towards water currents. Positive, as in the case of butterflies flying towards air currents. It can be negative rear taxis when the fish swims away from the water currents or butterflies fly away from the air currents. Then the last type of uh, tactic response will be osmotaxis. Osmotaxis refers to locomotor response due to change in osmotic balance. Osmotaxis is mainly experienced by the crabs. Example, when the crabs come out of the ocean water, their bodies can easily get diluted by water that is not hypertonic. So to avoid dilution of their bodies, crabs will dig deep into the sand and find water which is hypertonic and that will help them by making their bodies not to be diluted by water. So in that case they'll experience positive osmotaxis. Then what are the significance or importance of tactic responses? One, through positive chemotaxis, fertilization will take place in the most plants Fertilization will also take place in uh, other plants that have flowers because when pollen grains land on the stigma, this is a flower, when a pollen grain lands on the stigma, it begins to grow down the style. It grows down the style until it reaches the ovary. The ovary secretes a chemical substance that attracts the pollen grains. So in that case, fertilization will take place in flowering plants. Fertilization will take place in mosses and ferns through positive chemotaxis. Through negative chemotaxis, some living organisms like insects will be able to escape uh, chemical destruction by the insecticides and therefore that will increase their chances of survival. Through positive phototaxis, Euglena is capable of exposing its body to maximum absorption of sunlight which is then used in the process of photosynthesis. Through negative phototaxis, maggots and termites are capable of escaping predation and that increases their chances of survival. Fine, so those three are the significance of osmosis, I mean, uh, tactic responses. So we'll move to a specific type of response and that will be reception, response, and coordination in plants. So the first type of response that you've just looked into, that is taxis, that was a general response. But now I want to look at reception, response, and coordination in plants, which will deal with specific types of responses. Plants do not have complicated and well-developed uh, organs for reception, response, and coordination. But they, they are still capable of experiencing reception, response, and coordination within their bodies in their simple forms. Because without reception, response, and coordination within the bodies of plants, they will not be able to adapt to the environment, and therefore they will die and finally become extinct. So, plants do have two types of responses. They are tropic responses, which are growth responses, and two nastic responses. 
which are changes in position of some body parts or organs of plants. So plants do have these type, two types of responses. Tropic responses or tropism, which are growth responses, and nastic responses, which are change in position of some body parts of plants. So we'll start off with tropic responses. Tropic responses can also be referred to as tropism. So what are tropic responses or what is tropism? Tropism is growth response experienced by some parts of the body plants due to unidirectional stimulus. So tropism, growth responses experienced by some parts of the bodies of plants due to unidirectional stimulus. That is, a part of the body of the plant will respond to a particular stimulus and that particular stimulus is from one particular direction. We also have several types of tropism or tropic responses that are named according to the causative agent. That is, the type of stimulus that causes or evokes that response is the one that will be used to name the response. For example, if tropic response is due to light, we'll talk about phototropism. If tropic response is due to a chemical substance on one particular direction, we talk about chemotropism. If tropic response is due to water from one particular direction, one side, we talk about hydrotropism. If tropic response is due to Earth's gravity, we talk about hydro, I mean, talk about geotropism. So if response is due to Earth's gravity, geotropism. Due to water, hydrotropism. Due to light, phototropism. Due to chemical substance, chemotropism. So, tropic responses, just like tactic responses, are also named according to the stimuli that evoke them. So, we'll start off by observing or discussing one of the tropic responses, which in this case is chemotropism. Chemotropism is growth response that is mainly experienced by roots of plants due to unidirectional source of a chemical substance. For example, let's take this section here to represent the stem of a plant, the soil, and then the root of plant here. If fertilizer is placed within the soil from one particular direction, maybe this left right hand side, then after some time, the root of plant will grow bent towards the chemical substance, which in this case is fertilizer. So we talk of this being positive chemotropism. So chemotropism, growth response, mainly exhibited by roots of plants when they grow towards a chemical substance like fertilizer. Chemotropism is important because it enables plants to absorb mineral salts or some nutrients from the soil which are important for growth and development of the plant. Next type of tropic response that we look into is phototropism. Phototropism is growth response mainly experienced by shoots of seedlings due to unidirectional source of light. If I take this diagram here to present a pot, let's say you have a seedling growing there. If the seedling is covered with a carton and then a hole made within the carton to 
to allow light to enter from one particular direction. Then when light strikes the stem of the seedling, then after some time, the stem of the seedling will be seen or will be observed to grow bent towards the source of light. So after maybe two or three weeks, the stem will be observed growing bent towards the unidirectional source of light. So in this case we talk about positive phototropism. So positive phototropism is mainly experienced by stems or shoots of young seedlings when they're exposed to unidirectional source of light. Next type of tropic response that we look into is hydrotropism. Hydrotropism refers to growth response that is mainly experienced by roots of plants when they grow towards unidirectional source of water or moisture. So if I take this diagram to present the shoot, soil and then root of the plant. If water is found to be located on one side, maybe a river flowing here and the stem, I mean the plant growing on the other side, then the roots of plants after some time will be found to grow towards the source of water. This is important because when the roots reach source of water, the roots will absorb water, then water will be used in the process of photosynthesis. It will also be used in cooling the plant in hot weather through the process of transpiration. So in this case, we talk about positive hydrotropism. This is experienced by roots of plants. The other type of response that we look into will be geotropism. Geotropism is growth response due to Earth's gravity. We know that at the core of the Earth, we do have forces of gravity that, exact, that is exerted on any object that is found on the surface of the Earth. For example, if I throw this pen up, it will be pulled down. So, Earth's gravitational pull is usually exerted on any object that is found on the surface of the Earth. So, if that Earth's gravitational pull influences a response in a plant, we talk about geotropism. What happens is when the shoot, when a seedling is uprooted and then placed to lie horizontally on the surface of the ground, let's say that's the root, this section here represents the stem with the leaves. So if a seedling is uprooted and then placed to lie horizontally on the surface of the ground, after some time it will be observed that the roots will grow bent towards the inner part of the soil. The shoot will be observed to grow upwards against the surface of the soil. So in this case we say that the shoot experiences negative geotropism, while the roots experience positive geotropism. The shoot experiences negative geotropism because it's growing away from the Earth's gravity. The roots are said to experience positive geotropism because the roots are growing into the soil that is towards Earth's gravity. So, roots of plants usually experience positive geotropism, shoots of plants experience negative geotropism. The next type of tropic response that we look into is thigmotropism.
Pigmotropism refers to growth response due to contact. We do have some plants that have coiling stems, like passion fruit plants. They do have their stems growing coiled onto hard surfaces like poles of electricity or stems of woody plants. Stem same passion fruit plants do also have tendrils. Tendrils are thread-like structures that usually emerge from the stems of herbaceous plants. Take for example, let's take this to be stem of a tree. And then you have passion fruit plant growing close to the stem of the tree. So what happens is a section of the stem of the passion fruit plant, which in this case is here, will produce a thread-like structure called tendril. This tendril will grow and get coiled onto the stem of the tree. This coiling of the tendril on the stem of the tree is what we refer to as pigmotropism, growth response due to contact. Then we are done with the tropic responses. So we say tropic responses are growth responses that are experienced by some parts of the bodies of plants. Being growth responses, they are under the influence of hormones. The main hormone involved in tropic response is known as auxins. Auxins refers to a group of plant hormones with one specific example being indole acetic acid. This is the main hormone that plays a role in tropic responses. So out of the five tropic responses that we've talked about, one, phototropism, growth response experienced by shoots of seedlings due to your directional source of light, chemotropism, growth response experienced by roots of plants due to unidirectional source of a chemical substance, hydrotropism, growth response experienced by roots of plants due to unidirectional source of water, geotropism, growth response experienced by both shoots and roots, where the shoots of plants grow away from the core of the earth, experiencing negative geotropism, roots of plants grow deep into the soil towards the core of the earth, experiencing what we call positive geotropism. Then pigmotropism, growth response due to contact, experienced by tendrils of some plants or even stems of some herbaceous plants like passion fruit plants. Then what are the survival values of tropic responses? How are tropic responses important to plants? One. Through positive geotropism, the roots of plants grow deep into the soil, thereby enabling the roots to be able to reach mineral salts and absorb them and use them in growth and development. Through positive geotropism, the roots of plants are firmly attached into the soil, thereby providing anchorage, that is the plant will be firmly attached into the soil, such that when wind blows, the plant is not easily uprooted when, water f when rain falls and then water flows over the surface of the soil, the plant is not easily uprooted because it's firmly attached into the soil due to positive geotropism. Through positive chemotropism, the roots of plants are capable of reaching nutrients, e.g. fertilizers. After reaching the nutrients, the roots of plants will absorb those nutrients and then they'll be used in growth and development of the plants. For example, through positive chemotropism, roots of plants are capable of absorbing nitrates. Then of course nitrates will be used in protein synthesis. Nitrogen from nitrates will also be used in formation of chlorophyll. The other significance, through positive phototropism, the leaves of plants are exposed to maximum absorption of sunlight. 
When the leaves of plants absorb sunlight maximally, then that sunlight absorbed will be used in photosynthesis. Through positive hydrotropism, the roots of plants will be able to reach a water body. Water will then be absorbed by the roots of plants and then used in the process of photosynthesis. Water absorbed will also be used in the process of transpiration, which will bring about turgidity and provide support and also bring about opening and closing, opening and closing of stomata. It will also bring about cooling effect of the body of the plant when water evaporates through transpiration along with excess heat from the body of the plant. Then, let's look at similarities between tropic responses and taxis. Both of them we know are types of responses where one is general type of response, that is taxis, general type of response applying to animals, plants and other unicellular organisms and motile cells. Tropic responses, particular response or specific response to plants. So, similarities between taxis and tropism. One, both of them are influenced by similar stimuli. Both of them are influenced by identical that is identical stimuli evoke the two types of responses. For example, light. We have phototaxis, locomotory response due to variation of light. Then we have phototropism, growth response due to variation in light. We have chemotaxis, locomotory response due to unidirectional source of a chemical substance. We have chemotropism, growth response due to unidirectional source of a chemical substance. So they are influenced by identical stimuli. Two, the stimuli that evoke them are unidirectional. So they are brought about, brought about by unidirectional stimuli. What this means is the stimuli that will bring about taxis, the stimuli that will bring about tropic responses, they are from one particular direction. So both taxis and tropic responses are brought about by unidirectional stimuli. Third one, both of them are means of survival. That is, tropic responses and tactic responses enable living organisms to be able to survive. For example, through positive phototropism, the leaves of plants are exposed to maximum absorption of sunlight, which is then used in the process of photosynthesis. Through positive phototaxis, euglena are capable of exposing their bodies to sufficient amount of light, which is then absorbed and then used in the process of photosynthesis. So both of them enable living organisms to survive. Positive phototropism enables leaves to absorb maximum light that the plants will use in photosynthesis and enable them to grow well. Through positive chemotaxis, euglena will expose its body for maximum absorption of light, which it will also use in photosynthesis and enable it to grow well. So those are similarities, what tropic responses and, and tactic responses share in common. They are influenced by identical stimuli, they are brought about by unidirectional source of stimuli, both of them are means of survival for living organisms. Next we look at, uh, finally, we look at uh, differences between taxis and tropism. So what makes 
tactic response different from tropism. So in this case, we'll have to draw a table. So one side we have taxis, another end, tropism. First difference, tactic responses being locomotory responses are very fast. Tropic responses or tropism being growth responses, they are very slow. That means growth is a slow process, whereas locomotion is a fast process. That means for growth to take place, some time will have to be taken or wasted. Whereas for tactic responses, being locomotive response, it's a very fast response. Two, for locomotion to take place, it does not have to depend on hormones. So taxis is independent of hormones. Tropism or tropic responses are dependent on hormones. That is, for growth to take place, there must be growth hormones. Or for growth of a section of a plant to take place, hormones will be required. In this case, the hormone that plays a major role, as we had mentioned before, indolacetic acid, that belongs to the group of auxins. Third one, for uh, taxis, it is locomotory response. That means it involves change in position of the whole body of an organism from one place to another. But tropism is non-locomotory. That means in tropism for response to take place, it does not need to change the whole body of the plant from one place to another, but it's only a section of the plant that is involved, a section of the plant. Then the last one, taxis is a general response. Taxis is a general response because it applies to plants, applies to animals, and also applies to motile cells, that is cells that can be able to move, like the sperm cells of the moss and, mosses and ferns. But for tropism or tropic responses, tropic responses are specific. That is, they apply strictly to plants and not any other living organism. And that marks the end of our lesson today. So next lesson we start on nastic responses. Right now we are done with the general response which will taxis and then specific response to plants which is tropism. As we had mentioned before, plants do have two types of specific responses, tropism and nastism. So next we look into nastic responses. <laughs>